Thank you so much for Corel for hosting today. We are going to be painting this adorable puppy. Um, I think her name is Blossom and Susan Gertz was generous enough to let me paint this gorgeous portrait. Um, so we're going to move through a lot of information today and I'm going to try to give you as many gold nuggets as possible. But first we really need to just do two very simple tricks on our Wacom tablet. So today I'm working with the Wacom Intuist Pro, the medium size with just the basic pen that comes with it. And I'm on a Mac, so I'm gonna go under Preferences and I'm gonna open up, uh, let's close that, um, my Wacom Tablet Preferences. And you need to make sure that with whatever pen that you're using, this is my preference, that the tip feel is set to soft and the tilt, sensi tilt sensitivity is set to high. I don't set anything with my functions. I actually turn all of those off I don't use touch, um, it just kind of gets in the way when I'm painting. And then eventually what I tell students or artists is if you find you're using commands all the time, then go ahead and program that into your clickers here. But really all you need to really make sure you're doing is tip feel and tilt sensitivity. So we went soft and high. And then for you lefties out there, make sure that your mapping is set to where you want it. So for me, I make sure my um, express keys are on the right side of my tablet. Um, so with that done, we're gonna click out of there. It will remember those settings until we come back and change it. Now this is kind of the semi-finished version of the pup. I'm gonna show you where we started out. And that was the prepped version, meaning it was retouched, it's had enhancements done, it's been cropped, um, I've prepared the file. But we're going to go back a little bit further um, on this and kind of get Painter set up just bare minimum basics here. So we're working in Corel Painter 2020 today. And there are a few little tweaks that you might consider making just so things run a little bit more fast, a little bit more smoothly. Um, there are going to be a little things that look different on other people's computers. So on a Mac, you're going to find Corel Painter 2020 preferences. I think on a PC it's under file or edit but you're looking for your preferences pane to set this up. So we're gonna go to general. I have turned off create backup on save, but I believe everything else is the same. Under brush cursor, my preference is using brush ghost instead of enhanced brush ghost because I really like to be able to see the actual shape of the tip of my brush. It's a visual thing, that's just my preference. It's not gonna make Painter um, behave any better, it's just a preference. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple of these because I don't change some of them, but when I get down to interface, let's see, we're actually gonna skip that one. Oh, I'm sorry, we're actually not. Um, on display, I'm going to uncheck area averaging. On performance, um, this is going to look a little different on everybody's computer because it's reading your guts of your computer. So how many cores you have, um, what kind of hard drives are inside of it. So this might look a little bit different on everybody's machine. So leave the cores and your RAM, just leave that alone. But take your undo levels all the way down to 10. If you're feeling a little bit skittish or shy, because if you know um, anything about Painter, we don't have a dedicated history palette. So you just get iterative undos. So one undo, you get one take back. The next undo, you go back another step. So if you feel a little bit shy about that, go to about 15. But the way that we're working in Painter with cloning tools and with layers, it gives us the freedom to not have so many undos. And the more undos you're gonna have, the slower Painter's gonna have to perform because it has to remember so many steps back. So it kind of bloats the program. So the fewer undos you have, the better off you're gonna be. Um, scratch drive, you can leave it internal if you're working on a laptop. It's really nice to have something uh, external if you can get it. Cloning, we are going to just leave these top two checked uh, where it says open clone source panel and clear canvas. But otherwise, go ahead and uncheck, uncheck everything else. Image source, go ahead and check that. And I know I'm talking really fast here, but we've got so much to go through and this will be recorded so you can go back and watch the recording. Tablet, I don't touch. Connections, I don't touch. We're gonna click OK. Now one big thing that I made the mistake last week redoing and it cost me a lot of time fixing is make sure your color management is set up 
So under Canvas, we're going to go to Color Management Settings. Now, if you are a photographer, more than likely you are working in either sRGB or Adobe RGB 98. So the general rule of thumb is you want to keep it consistent how you capture in camera to how you edit to paint to maybe printing. We're going to leave printing at the very, very end. That one can change. But try to keep it consistent between camera, edit, painting. So typically photographers are capturing in Adobe RGB 98. So I need to go up to this default RGB profile and change that to Adobe RGB 1998. Leave the CMYK alone. We're going to say use embedded, use embedded, check, check, leave it alone, leave it alone. PC people, this is going to look a little different for you at the bottom here. Leave it alone. Now I'm going to save this as a preset by clicking on the plus sign. And I'm going to save this as Adobe RGB. And you can put 98 or not. I'm going to put save. Um, if we need an sRGB one, we can do the exact same thing and just pick out the sRGB. I'm going to choose the one all the way towards the bottom that has nothing at the end. That is the worldwide standard generic, every lab has this color profile, sRGB, blah, 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 dash 2.1. Leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone, use embedded, use embedded, check, check, leave it alone, leave it alone, click the plus sign. So this is going to save it as a new preset. So now when we look at our presets menu, we have both Adobe RGB and sRGB. Now this one happened to be an Adobe RGB profile, so I want to keep that color management according to the image that I am painting or bringing in. Now because we had it, um, we checked that ask uh, when opening or ask if we have a mismatch pro color profile. If you have something that's another profile opening in Painter, it's going to give you a little error box saying, wait a minute, this is not the right color profile, what do you want to do? You would say use embedded profile and change that back. So now that color management set, we can take a look at our palettes. Painter gives us so many palettes. They're all found under your window dialog. And there's so much customization here. You could be in here for days. But I really like to keep a very simple screen. Once I figured out the tools that I can just bare bones, keep it really simple, and then just focus on your painting. You don't need a whole bunch of tools out unless you don't get distracted. I'm a total squirrel person, <laughs> so I need just a few palettes out. I'm going to keep it really simple. So the bare minimum for me, I'm going to have my toolbar, which is always on the left here. This is if Painter were to open for the first time for you. I'm going to grab my color wheel. If you want to move the palette, grab the name of the box. If you want to, or I'm sorry, if you want to undock it from like a cluster of palettes, move the name. If you want to move the actual palette, grab the dark gray part of the box or the palette. So we can enlarge these. I like a nice big color wheel. And I'm left-handed, so everything's going on the left hand of the screen. Now I don't use the mixer. I don't use color set libraries for basic teaching. But I do like layers, and I'm not sure I'm going to explore harmonies today. But I'm going to take out channels, and we're going to keep layers, and just move that over here. You always want to have layers in front of you because that's one of your troubleshooting things you're going to look at first. I need two more palettes, so I'm going to go to Window, uh, Clone Source, and you can see it's clustered with a whole bunch of other photo art palettes. So we only need the Clone Source. We're going to click on the name Clone Source, pull that out, and close Photo Art. That was a palette drawer. And this is a little bit too large. It's taking up too much screen real estate. So I'm going to make this smaller. And I'm going to explain what all of this is in just a second. I'm just getting set up right now. And we need one more. So I'm going to go to Window, Brush Control Panels, Brush Calibration. Now this guy I cannot live without. So you have to have this open. So again, this is part of a brush um, uh, palette drawer. I'm sorry. So we're going to pull the word brush calibration, click on the word, and that will undock it from or undecluster, if you want to use that term, from general brush controls palette drawer. Close that and move it to somewhere you're happy with. Since I'm on a laptop, I'm on a tiny screen right now. We'll try to move them over here. Now, once you've got all your palettes set up to where you're happy with it, I'm just going to move him over. 
or her. We are going to go to Window, Layout, Save Layout, and I'm going to name this Lefty1. So that way the program remembers where all of my palettes are located. Uh, because I have a three-year-old that likes to play in painter, and she does like to paint and close the palettes and moves things, and she's still trying to figure out how the Wacom works. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk a little bit about brushes. Now today I'm actually going to be showing you all brushes that come in painter. They've got phenomenal brushes. What is the of the utmost importance is that you use something that's pressure sensitive like a Wacom pen or some kind of stylus that is pressure sensitive. If you're using a mouse to paint, you get one level of pressure sensitivity. So you're really not getting any kind of expression um, to go with your hand in terms of speed and pressure. So it's really important. Try to get a Wacom, a Cintiq. Um, there's other uh, uh, tablets out there. Just get something pressure sensitive. So with the brushes, let me open up a blank canvas here. Just a small one. Let's talk a little bit about the brushes here. One of the brushes I love using for fur, and this applies to short fur, long fur, clumpy fur, curly fur, is uh, they're round-based brushes. So I like using bristle-based bristle brushes because it shows you the hair, uh, individual hair. So I'm gonna bring out my little brush palette here so you can see it a little bit easier. And this is your brushes palette. On the little, um, the left icon, it's your last used brush. So that's not reset, that's your last. Just FYI, that's brand new. So if we click on that, we get this drop down. On the left hand side, these are all of your brush categories. On the right hand side, these are all of your brush variants. So any category has a whole slew of brushes within that. So you have all these toolboxes. Now, if we go under oils, we're gonna go find oil smeary round. I think I should be selected on it. Yep, smeary round. So you can see the, the tip of the dab and then a little bit of an example of the brush mark that it makes. So I'm gonna select smeary round at the very top of the properties bar because my brush is selected. We have the very top left is reset. So I'm gonna reset that. So it will look exactly the same for you when you bring it out of the box. Make a mark here. Now that looks pretty digital. So I'm gonna make a few tweaks to this and you are gonna love this brush. So starting over from the top side of this properties bar, we've got reset, we've got freehand marks, we've got constrained straight line marks, um, we've got new stroke options, which is mainly, um, this is for horizon lines, pers perspective stuff, things I don't use, uh, just not in freehand painting. So I'm gonna skip that one. We've got size, we've got opacity. Opacity I want you to think of is how much coverage you're getting. So this one, I'm gonna start out really high at 100% just to be able to show you how much oomph we're getting out of the brush. Reset. Pull this down. If you hover over top long enough, it will try to explain what it does and give you some examples. So reset. If you fall asleep during my webinar, this is probably the biggest thing you need to listen to. So listen up right now. Reset, short for resaturation, is how much stuff is loaded or charged on your brush. Reset in color is how much stuff is on your brush. So at 100%, we have that brush fully charged, fully loaded with stuff, with color. Reset is how much stuff is loaded on your brush. I'm gonna keep saying that over and over again because this is everything. Reset at zero means there is nothing on your brush, but your brush is still active. If your resaturation is turned to zero, your brush is live, but there's nothing on it. So that means if there is a resaturation field to your brush, you can make it a blender by turning the resaturation to zero. So resaturation is how much stuff is loaded to your brush. This is huge. If there's a number in that field, that means, that means there's something on your brush. If it's at zero, that means it is now a blender. Now, if we want to determine how smoothly 
we're applying brush work. That is your bleed. So how smoothly things are bleeding or fighting each other. So at 100% bleed, you can see that's nice and smooth. Now granted, my opacity, the strength of my brush is very, very high. So if I dialed that down to about 30%, see how nice and smooth that is? That is because my bleed is at 100%. This is very, very important for fur painters. If you want that glossy, shiny, smooth, sheen fur coat, that showstopper fur coat, you want a very high bleed, meaning it's going to be smooth and feathered and really luscious. So 100% bleed is going to give you a very smooth brush. On the flip side, if you drop it down to zero, you get a very aggressive brush meaning it's going to grab one color and it's going to drag it until you lift up. So you can see it's not blending or feathering with any surrounding colors. It is a very aggressive brush. So if I turn that back up to 100% opacity, aggressive brush. It's still blending because my reset zero, but my bleed is zero. So we are not smooth. We are aggressive. So reset and bleed are huge for fur painters. Now let me get some reset here. Let's put some color on it. Now the next thing you need to know with fur or hair painting in general is feature. Feature is the space between your bristles in a brush. So you can see as I zoom in, we've got a little bit of space between each of those bristles. That is your feature. If we dial up that feature, let's go to 20. So that was 4.7. Same brush. The only thing I've changed is feature. You see how it's expanding the space between those bristle hairs. If you dial up your feature to a really nice happy place when you're painting fur, it looks like really nicely spaced brush hairs instead of, let's try two, clumpy turd. So this looks like a really bad marker. This looks like a really nice brush. These two up here I would totally use for fur. So if you need to adjust how bristly or how scratchy or how separated your brush is, and this is only for um, bristle-based brushes, you want to adjust your feature. Now one thing to keep in mind is that little uh, lock box next to your feature will automatically resize your feature every time you resize your brush. So once you're really happy with a feature number, and I'm constantly changing this according to what I'm painting. So something tiny to something big. So say this is a pretty good starting point. You know, like oh, I'm pretty happy with that. I'm gonna go to a smaller area. You notice how my feature automatically rescaled with the brush. So that's just one thing less for you to have to worry about. So those are really the biggest things you need to worry about with fur painting is reset, bleed, and feature. If your brush is too heavy and it feels too aggressive, just dial down the opacity go lower, and then try again. So now that that's out of the way, let's go back to our brushes. And I'm going to open up the first one of this. So we'll keep this in mind. This is where we're going to hopefully end up today because we're going to fly through this. This is what it started out as. Susan Gertz's beautiful portrait um, was shot on the gray background. I threw in one of my Parsley's Preferred Patina's hand-painted backgrounds over top of it, set it to soft light, masked it out so it would fit over the dog, and I did all of my editing in Adobe Photoshop. Um, so any kind of value changes, cropping, um, any kind of color changes that you wanted to do, you'll notice, um, sorry, you'll notice that I actually did a little bit of just boosting some of those low lights and highlights. Anytime you can get a hair light on a subject, it's going to make for painting gold. Um, hair lights are just so beautiful on paintings, and it gives you really nice separation and interest. So FYI, if you're shooting for a painting, give yourself a hair light. Do yourself a favor. Um, so let's go ahead and close out of that and open up the first one. We're going to find prep. So once I've done all my prep work, um, in Photoshop, I would go ahead and save it as a TIFF file. If I started from a RAW file, you have to save it as an 8-bit. Now here is a good example. 
it says the document has an embedded color profile that does not match the adult uh, the default RGB profile so I need to actually use the embedded profile here here we go and I need to make sure that my canvas color management settings are set up correctly which it wasn't it was set to sRGB so that's why my image was Adobe my color management settings were set to sRGB which is going to screw up all of your numbers so make sure that they match so we need to go back and pick this put this back to Adobe because I think my little preset didn't save correctly so now we're good so we the very first thing we're going to do we've got two options in painter we can freehand paint everything or we can do a version of cloning uh, I will explain what that is here um, because I have thrown in a painted, a pre-painted background here, I'm going to go ahead and say File Clone. So what this is going to do is you'll see it's made me an untitled document. We're going to mount it by hitting Command M for PC people. That's Control M for Mount or Mickey Mouse. And we're going to take a look at our clone source palette. Now, if you look at the bottom, you'll see Toggle Tracing Paper and Opacity. I'm going to click toggle tracing paper so it activates the opacity bar and click down to zero. Now because I've done file clone which makes a complete duplicate and it's made me a new document to paint on, I'm actually going to start painting on a layer here. So when we're under our, under our layers palette, if we go to the very bottom of the layers palette we have all these different layers options. So I'm going to click on the third one over on the bottom and it says new layer. Again, if you hover over top of things, it tells you what it's going to do. So new layer. Sorry, I only need one layer. And we're going to paint on this layer for now. So we're going to take our smeary round brush and I'm going to make a few tweaks to it. So I'm going to hit reset. I'm going to leave it at the size that it comes out of. So it's like 31.2. I'm going to leave 100% opacity. And I'm going to boost that reset to 20. And the bleed I'm going to drop down to 60 and the feature I'm going to put to 7 and I'm going to make a brush mark always make test marks to see if you like it and I really really like that for fur so I'm going to use that as a starting point now if you find a brush that you really like you can go ahead and save it so I'm going to go to brushes save variant and name it something functional and according to what version you built it in because brushes will not go backwards. They will crash older versions of Painter because brush technology keeps evolving. So I'm going to actually name this 20, 20 um, for cloner. So Smeary Round is what it started out as. I made all those tweaks. I went to brushes, say variant. And I'm telling myself that I built this in Corel Painter 2020. So if I really like this brush and I want to save it, uh, send it to other people, this tells them you can only use this in Corel Painter 2020 or newer. And then it's a fur cloner. So we'll see that it shows up at the very bottom of our oils uh, category. Now, if we turn this into clone mode, which means if we go over to our color wheel and click on this little clone color icon at the bottom, it grays out our color wheel. Grays out our color wheel. There we go. And what this does is it applies the brushes stroke style to our brushwork. But instead of painting with color, now we are painting with a photograph. So you can see it's not making mud. It's actually picking up the image underneath or picking up the image from our clone source and applying that in our brushwork. So we're basically applying that brush's style, but painting with a photograph. We're not painting with color, we're painting with photograph. So if I wanted to look at my original image, I can activate my tracing paper, which is Command T. That's a shortcut. Or click down here and say Toggle Tracing Paper. And it is pulling your source information from whatever is loaded into your clone source palette. So this Susan Gertz Blossom image, my prep file, that is what we're going to be cloning from. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a save, do a file save as. 
and it's going to automatically come un up untitled. So I'm going to find the original prep file name. I think it was this. And I'm going to put in front of it one PTR. That's just my quirky way of saving it. I like it better for looking up um, uh, at per version. And I'm going to click Uncompressed. You have two different ways of saving this, a Painter Riff or Photoshop. If you're wanting to go back into Photoshop to print or do any adjustments afterwards, you want to save your last version as a Photoshop file. If you want Painter to remember your clone source and have like an attachment to it, go ahead and save it as Painter Riff. So for now, I'm going to save it as a Painter Riff. But if you save it as a Photoshop file, just know Painter is going to have an error menu and say, hey, this isn't a riff. Are you sure you know what you're doing? And you're going to say, chill, yes, OK. You can open up both of them. So I'm going to save this as a Photoshop just to show you. Hey, this isn't a riff file. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Yes. Now I'm going to show you what's going to happen if you save it as a Photoshop document. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you can open it up in Adobe programs, which a lot of photographers use. You cannot open up a RIF file in Adobe programs. That's the only downside of it. So if we were to close Blossom, which I recommend closing down Painter when you're not using her, and then we come back, we reopen our work. So say, I want to find the painting I just did. Please say I, I saved it in the same place. <laughs> Mom brain. Uh, let me do the one painter. So say we're going to go back and we're going to start cloning. I'm excited. I'm going to paint, blah, blah, blah. This is not my clone image. As my three-year-old would say, this is not right. So if we look back in our clone source, this is after reopening a file if you saved Photoshop documents. You look up and you say clone source palette, source current pattern. That's not right. It should be embedded image but we don't have an embedded, embedded image because we just reopened it. So we're going to go browse and we're going to look for something. So I need to find that original image and I'm going to find, I think it was prep. Nope, it was this one. Sorry. There we go. So now if I toggle my tracing paper, remember command T, and then turn that tracing paper to 0% opacity so you can either see all of your painting or all of your prep file. It's just less confusing. There you go. Oh, there you are. I see you. So that's the only thing that you need to know to reattach your painting to your clone source. And there's nothing wrong with it. It just takes two quick seconds. And then now we're, now we're back to painting the correct file. So I'm going to click to PTR, save this as a new document. Make sure you click uncompressed. So with this brush, I love using the oil smeary round for hair, both long and short. And you'll notice that I am painting in the direction. I'm going to work on one side here. I'm painting in the direction the hair is laying. So it gives you that light, bouncy, slightly wavy feel. I'm not trying to cut into sections that, um, that aren't laying that way because they, I want to keep the hair looking wavy and exactly like it is. Now here's the bad part to just relying on cloning when you're painting. If you're going to rely on cloning, it's going to only end up looking like a blended photograph, which is fine. But I think as an artist, what's gorgeous about this program is the opportunities here to freehand paint over top. And when I say that, I mean, you know, you give yourself a really nice clone clean base and then you get out of cloning and you turn this back into color and you find some color brushes and there are all these opportunities to start exaggerating these values, exaggerating these colors, bringing in little pops of zinger colors and just, uh, you know, bringing out your own flair and brush strokes and brushwork. Because right now this is pretty, but it's just looking like blended photograph. You know, it's just kind of meh. So if you're wanting to do that and take it a little bit further, we're going to go with a few more extra brushes. There is one in Artist Oils that I love. So I'm going to go up to Artist Oils. 
and we're going to pick up the Real Oils Filbert and I'm going to reset it so it looks exactly the same for you. So making a test mark. Ah, nuts. I painted on my canvas. I hear my little one chuckling in the background. So straight out of the box, you know, it's workable, but we're going to make a few changes. So Artist Oils, we're going to tweak the feature to it. Or now remember, feature is how separated or how bristly it is, how scratchy it is. This one's a little bit too clumpy, meaning the bristles are too close together. So that tells me right now the feature is 2.4. The feature needs to be enlarged. So we're going to try it at five. Well, let's try it at four. Ooh, four is not bad. Let's try five. Oh, I like five. Okay. And I'm undoing, so Command-Z or Edit Undo, but you have to make a really hard, um, obvious test mark to see if you like this brush stroke or not. So it's a uh, feature has changed to five. I've left everything else alone. Let me move this guy down so you can see. Um, now, if you wanted to make any further tweaks, all of your brush uh, properties can be found either under Window, Brush Control Panels, or you can find them under these little um, icons. We've got dab options that will change your brush entirely. That changes the type, uh, how the head is chiseled out. These will change your brush completely, the profiles of them. We've got uh, dab, sorry, just talked about that. The bristles, I'm not gonna touch that. We're gonna keep it really simple. And then we have all the advanced options. <coughs> Excuse me, I need some tea. We need uh, the advanced options. This is going to change brush to brush, where this shows you basically the applicable brush properties or brush settings for that brush. So we can change any of these at any time. If they're highlighted, there's something you can change. If they're grayed out, like it's like muted in the background, you can't touch it. Earl Gray. I love tea. Okay, so we're going to close out of there. For now, I'm really liking how this brush is. So I'm going to move this back up. I just moved my color palette to show you those drop downs. And this brush does really well if you enable your brush calibration. Now, brush calibration is going to have that extra level of pressure sensitivity between your tablet and painter. So I'm going to click on the bottom right icon that says set brush calibration settings. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it's only going to really give you the recording of the last flick that you make. You can see with every mark, it's kind of recording both the uh, pressure and the speed from the time I touch down to the time I lift up. So go ahead and just make one mark. And it's just however you would normally like make a, a brush mark on an edge. So I'm pretty happy there. But now it is super sensitive to my hand, and I love, love, love this brush. Alla Prima painters, really sketchy freehand painters, you're going to love this. So I'm going to save this brush because we didn't do too many tweaks. We just made a feature change. And I'm going to go to Brushes, Save Variant. Once again, I'm going to go 2020, and let's put fur, I'm going to put fur edges. So you'll notice it updates it. And this guy is awesome for freehand color in edges, especially when your subject uh, meets your background. So I'm going to take my dropper tool, which is D on your keyboard, or dropper tool up here. And I'm going to sample this. And you can see what it's kind of doing is it splays out, it shrinks up, you get a little bit of this randomness to it. It's like a real filbert brush. So on a filbert brush, um, it's almost like a little bit of a rounded uh, rectangle. So you get all these different sized edges. It's like a flat brush that's gorgeous. So I'm taking D for dropper and B for brush, and I'm exaggerating just tiny steps from what I sample and making edges there. So this is the beauty. Give yourself a cloned clean base. We cloned in. Now we can freehand over top and really start to bring this to life and kind of inject our own personality into the paint. So I'm gonna add some brushwork. I'm gonna enhance some highlights. And time is flying by. 
<laughs> so what I might end up doing is um, opening up some finished, more finished pieces. This is one of the brushes that is just so much fun to play with. If the brush is too heavy for you, you can always drop down your opacity. So I'm at 100% right now. So if I drop down to like 20%, and you have a very light version of it. But it's a gorgeous brush for hair, especially short tufted hair. It's beautiful. It's just highly pressure sensitive. So I'm going to save that as a version. Now let me go through a few brushes for you um, for the whiskers and the nose. And let's open up one of our more finished pieces. So I've got um, Untitled 4 should be it. And this one's already got its clone source attached to it because it was saved as a riff. So this is what I had uh, painted in. You could see all the little fur has been painted at the top of the head. We've got some extra colors added in. It's just more interesting. It doesn't look like a blended photograph. Um, I've even taken colors from the background and started pushing them into the fur and then bringing the fur back over top. So it starts to bring the subject and the background together into a cohesive painting. <clears throat> so at any time if you need to work on layers 2020 is really great about it it's far more stable for it um, in the past I've hated working with layers but I have converted <laughs> since then so um, let's see whiskers and nose so for the nose I don't know if I painted the nose in this one oh I did all right so I'm going to actually clone out the nose back to the original, but this is her original nose. We've got a little bit of that spongy padding texture, and I want to kind of keep that in a painting. And I'm worried that the round brush is going to make it too bristly, so let's bring back the original. I'm going to go to cloners. There should be a straight cloner in here somewhere. Straight cloner. You know what, let me work on a layer here. Make good habits. Here we go. So that's bringing back the straight nose just so I can show you what I did. And I'm gonna go use um, Artist Favorites Impressionist. So Impressionist is one of the longtime favorite brushes of painter. It's in so many versions. I don't know how far back that's gone. I'm gonna reset it. And I don't know if I've made any tweaks to this one. I think I used it straight out of the box. Turn it into a cloner. And in small steps, I'm covering that nose. And I'm gonna be really careful where the shadow and the highlight breaks. And I know I'm gonna to have to add some highlights on top of this because it's getting a little mushy. And to show that this is a wet nose, you really need some harder highlights. Now this brush is getting a little bit too aggressive for me, so I'm gonna drop down the opacity. It's at 100%, let's drop down to 40. <coughs> let's go to 30. me a pretty good coverage. Make sure you get all of it. Let's spend a little bit more time than this, but I'm trying to give you as many brushes as I can. Now I missed my really, really hot highlights, so I'm going to turn this brush back into color mode. And I need some really, really hot highlights. I'm going to push it way up there, make a tiny brush. Give myself just a little kiss of highlight, maybe a little bit lower light brush. Little kiss of highlight there. Just watch your lighting pattern, make sure it's consistent with the eyes. And you get a little bit more of that spongy nose texture. I've lost some of the blacks in there. So I'm gonna put that back in. There we go. You can always use chalks. Those are really nice on noses. So I'm pretty happy with that. Now for the whiskers, 
Whiskers are like eyelashes. I really like to, as you can see here, I've actually blended out the base before um, cloning, or I'm sorry, freehanding over top. So I blend it out underneath with that smeary round brush. And by that, what I mean is I'm going in this kind of direction instead of this kind of direction, because then if you're cloning that direction, you're gonna pick up the whiskers. And I wanna get rid of them before I freehand them back in. So if we look at the original, she's got a lot of whiskers. Now for whiskers, you can use a lot of detail brushes. Uh, there are a couple in oils that are really nice. Um, I like the oils Speckle uh, Fine Art, I think that's what it's called, uh, Speckle Fine Oil Brush. So the Speckle Fine Oil Brush, I'm going to reset. I don't think I need to make any tweaks other than size. I'm going to go really small. Really, 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 really small. There we go. We're probably at a two or a three pixel brush. Come on, number two. Much better. So I'm going to definitely do that one on a separate layer. Take a look. I should probably enable brush calibration with this one so I get a really nice pinch at the end. And I'm going to kind of eyeball it here. Get some browns and then gray them out a little bit. And you can see she's got black whiskers, gray whiskers, light gray whiskers, almost like a light, 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 light gray whisker, but she doesn't have bright white whiskers until we get to kind of like the, the catch, the light side. So we're going to just add a couple. They don't have to be exact, but you just want them to be interesting and not cartoony looking. Add some lighter ones. And if they're too light, because that one, they might be getting too light for me. Um, since we did this on a separate layer, the other brush that's really nice on this is a Detail Oils brush, is we can lower that layer's opacity by going to the layer properties and just lowering that opacity a bit, because that might be a bit too harsh. I'm feeling a little bit better about those. Drop it down a bit. So the speckle is good. The detail oils brush is always a favorite. Just make sure it's nice and small. Maybe try two or three um, uh, pixels for your size. And definitely set your brush calibration. And I'm actually straightening out her whiskers too much. If you look at it, they actually curve in. So I need to make that happen a little bit more. Okay. All right. So I've given you some whiskers, nose, fur brushes, edges. Uh, let's talk about a blender and a chalk. So occasionally, you're going to want to blend some edges, especially when you start getting into... Um, values that are just too harsh against each other or when your subject meets your background. Now, with the oils, smeary round brush. Remember, because we have reset in there, we can always turn our reset to zero and get a really nice blender. I'll show you over the eye just to show you something crazy. 100% opacity. <coughs> Excuse me. So you get a really, really nice blender. This is very soft. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that one's also set to 36% opacity on the layer. Let me try another one. There we go. So you can turn your smeary round brush into a beautiful blender if you turn the reset to zero and then bump up your bleed to like 100% and you'll get a really, really smooth, smooth blender. Um, I'm gonna drop my opacity down maybe to 40%. And it's just a really nice blender. So since I like that, I'm going to save it by going to Brushes, Save Variant, and say 2020 Blender. Now for another brush, if you want to add a little bit of texture, 
I find if you add a little tiny change of texture, it adds interest in a painting. I'm going to use a chalk. So I'm going to go up to chalks and I'm going to pull up a chunky oil, I think. Chunky, I think it's chunky oil pastel. Now the beauty about chalks or a shape based brush is they typically play up your paper texture. And we haven't talked about paper textures yet because the bristle, ba bristle based brushes do not show them. So your grain will have an icon next to it and that is going to be your paper textures. Um, it used to be down here on your toolbar. So your paper textures are basically what kind of texture um, it, over the black part it's going to hit. So they're grayscale, basically sheets of paper. Um, I really love Artist Canvas, but because this pre-painted background has more of a, I don't know, pebbly watercolor paper texture, I'm going to look for something that's a little bit rougher. So simulated wood grain is good. Um, the pavement's good. The Italian watercolor paper would be nice with this. That might be a little bit too dull. Um, let's try that one above it that has a really good contrast to simulated wood grain. You can see the difference here. We actually get a little bit of texture with this brush. So that is all in your grain. If you have a very low grain, let me move this down, you will see just a hint of texture. So let's put this down to 5%. Now you see how it's just barely skimming the surface. Now on the flip side, if we push this up to 100%, it is just really mashing into that paper texture so much so that we see no more paper texture. So if you want to see paper texture, make sure that you put your grain to a very low number, like f between like five and, I don't know, five and 12%. I kind of land on like seven. That's just my happy place for whatever reason. I, I don't know why. I like it. I like it. It shows paper texture beautifully. Uh, so I'm going to leave that brush as is. I got to turn something off my Wacom that keeps tilting my canvas. And anytime you use something with texture, it is beautiful to use it in areas of highlights, pops of color, accents. It's just a really nice place for texture. So, for instance, I'm going to have highlights back here for that hair light. Got just a hint of hair light. <coughs> now that brush is a little aggressive for me at 55% opacity, so I'm going to drop that down about 20 percent oh let's go to 10 percent i'm really chickening out light 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 pressure and it's a really pretty brush now we can take this one step further and this is something that took me forever to realize that we had this in painter and i'm sure it's been around forever but there's something called stroke attributes and this is genius um, that painter has this so we can go to window let me see if I can find it again. Brush control panels. I think it's brush media stroke attributes. If you say use stroke attributes and put merge mode to something like overlay or soft light, I'm going to try soft light and pick a light color. And we're going to do this on a separate layer so you can see the difference. I'm going to do a really, really light color. There we go. And I liked doing this with the round brushes. You see how it's constantly building my highlights in the hair? This might be a little bit too red. This is a really great way to build up your highlights upon highlights upon highlights upon highlights, <coughs> excuse me, without changing the value in your um, color wheel. So I set this brush onto stroke attributes and set that to soft light. Now, because this was too harsh, we can either layer mask it out or just drop down the opacity of that layer. But that's a great way to be able to build up the highlight sheen on the uh, animals using whatever brush you'd like. I've been using it with the oil smeary round and with the chalk brushes. And you'll see it just with each layer that you or each pass that you go, it just builds up. It's more intense, more intense, more intense. So it looks like a really nice, um, subtle raise of sheen, which in the past I used to do that all manually. And now that it's done for me, I'm like, hey, <laughs> this frees me up. So that's a little harsh as it is, just because I'm trying to fly through this. <coughs> but um, 
that is all I can think of for now. Tanya, can I open it up to any questions? I'm going to open up the finished yeah. ones. That was so great, Heather. Oh, good. Um, all right. So I've been tracking, um, and here's the good thing. You did such a great job explaining things. There's not, not a ton of questions, but I don't know. I probably have seven here. So okay. um, the first one goes back to when you were setting up your panels and palettes, and somebody had asked, why did you choose not to put them in a palette drawer? Um, probably the troubleshooting aspect of it. I find if something goes wrong, the first thing I like to do is look at the panels or the palettes. Um, so visually, am I on the wrong layer? Is my clone source the wrong thing? Uh, so those two I need to always see uh, separate. It's just a troubleshooting teaching thing. And then the brush calibration, I just like having handy because I'm lazy and I don't like looking for it. <laughs> so. Okay, understandable. Um, are you on Mac OS High Sierra, and what tablet are you using? I'm on Mojave, and uh, welcome into a Pro Medium, and it's not the newer one. I think this one's probably about three years old. And is that the one that you would recommend to somebody that's going out to get their first tablet? Uh, as far as size wise medium for sure the welcome into us pro series definitely you get um, far more pressure sensitivity levels if you're editing like if you're a photographer and you're editing you absolutely must go for the pro line um, yeah for sure if you can find the budget get the pro line <clears throat> the other tablets have only about half the pressure sensitivity levels okay fantastic um, why did you save your source photo as a TIFF? Um, good question. In When I was originally editing, uh, typically my workflow is to start from a raw file. I will actually edit as a 16-bit TIFF because you have such um, a large information set uh, in the 16-bit file. So it's just old school habit to save it as a TIFF file instead of a JPEG. But if you start out with a JPEG, you're going to want to end up saving as a JPEG. Okay. And then it's just in regards, sorry. Yeah. In regards of the size of the photo, do you determine based on the original photo size, what size you're going to paint at, or do you use some other means to enlarge oh. photos if need be? Really good question. Um, it depends on, I guess, two things, the capture and how you're going to print. So if the capture is done with a decent camera and it's not done with like a cell phone, then it's wide open. You can probably paint straight out of the camera. If it's done from a cell phone, it gets a little tricky. So what you're looking for is basically the pixel count that you have and then the quality of the image. So. If you're painting a cell phone image, you're going to have a completely different quality image than, say, from a DSLR. And you're going to look at the pixel count that you're having. And the simplest way I know how to make it is you move the decimal point over two points. Um, so say you want to get an 8 by 10. Your bare minimum pixel count needs to be 800 uh, by 1,000 pixels. So you just move your decimal point over two. Um, that's the bare minimum pixel count. Now, if you're looking at a cell phone image, 800 by 1,000 pixels versus a DSLR image, 800 by 1,000 pixels, they're going to be two totally different image qualities. So you might find yourself working a lot harder on the cell phone image versus the DSLR image. Uh, but that is the bare, bare minimum quality for print. So you might be more limited in what print sizes you can get out of something like a cell phone, but when you have like a point and shoot or a DSLR or something that's higher resolution, then you've got a lot more options for print sizes. But typically labs want um, about half size to full size. It's a little overkill when you get to printing. So you might have to call your lab to ask out what are the bare minimum specs, but that is the easiest way to think of it is the bare minimum is at size moved over two decimals at 100% uh, or 100 DPI or PPI. So, so you want an 8 by 10, it's 800 by 1,000 pixels. You want a 24 by 30, it's 2,400 by 3,000 pixels. That is the bare minimum count. Um, if you want a nice, happy, perfect world 
count, then you do it half size at 300 PPI. Gives you plenty of room. <coughs> All right, great. There <laughs> are so many questions coming through rapid fire right now that Sure. I just have to let you all know, well, we're just not going to be able to cover them. Um, so I will do my best to follow up. A lot of them relate to printing and, you know, they also want to see you paint eyes and oh, <laughs> and, backgrounds and it's just too much for us to go into. So yeah. I'm going to stick with the few that I have on my list here. Um, I'll paint an eye while we're, we're talking. Okay. There was a question, do you have a painter brush that you recommend using, and it could be the same one you have been using, for short-haired animals? Yeah, this merry round, um, you can do the same for the short hair, just drop your bleed to a low number. And okay. You'll get a nice, chunkier, stiffer brush marks. Do you have any recommendations for paid brush sets for creating animal portraits? Um, do I have to plug in Corel? <laughs> You can a, say whatever you like. It, we're okay. not. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got a really nice everyday brushes, uh, uh, everyday set of brushes that work with Painter. Um, I think they're 2016 and newer. And they're basically the brushes I use with each one of my paintings with um, fur and with people. So I've got all the round brushes, flat brushes, chunky brushes. <clears throat> That's what I would recommend for animals. I do have an older set of animal brushes, um, but you'll find them basically in the everyday brushes. Okay, uh, and then that's, that's great. What is the hotkey? I mean, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I have to have painter open sometimes, but is there a hotkey to change the brush reset and bleed? No, um, not that I remember, no. unless that's totally new in 2020. Okay. It's only for opacity okay. as a number. All right, and I don't know if there is some way to go into the preferences and change that, but um, it's something I can look into. Well, those were the questions. <laughs> Guys, I'm really sorry about having to cut the questions off, but we're at the top of the hour, and I really want to choose our winners that um, – the first person that I'm going to choose here, and this is going to be random selection, is going to get Heather's painted backgrounds collection. So mm -hmm. let's see here. It's the new okay. preferred patina set. Okay. Um, geez, I don't know how, if I mess up the last name, I'm sorry, but Mindy Guidry or Guidry. <laughs> um, you have won the backgrounds collection, so I will follow up with you after this. I'll send you an email and we'll be sure awesome. to let you know how you can get those. Congratulations. And then the next winner is going to get Painter 2020. And that winner is Howard Park. So Howard, awesome. I will follow up with you. Hopefully you don't have it already. Heather, that was so much information in an hour. Everybody's, they've asked me a million times, is this recorded, is this recorded? Because they're going to go back and watch it over and over and over. Yeah. So I just want to say thank you so much for a wonderful session. And I hope that you all have a, a wonderful rest of your day and that your weather is just as great as it is here in Chicago. Wonderful. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.